friends, welcome to day 25 of Inktober 2015. The prompt for today is, the ghost in my tea... Oh my goodness, there's a typo in this. <laughs> How have I never noticed that? I've read this thing a million times. I swear, you know how people have selective hearing? I swear I have selective spelling. Or uh, when you read your own thing over and over and over again and you know what the words are supposed to say, I just pick, I never pick up on the spelling mistakes. It says tea post instead of teapot. I'm gonna have to get over that, but that has really traumatized my day. <laughs> okay, the ghost in my teapot sprouted cute antlers, and so did most of my small hanging planters. So that's the prompt we're going with today. I will say straight up, as you're watching this uh, kind of progress, you'll notice that there's a very, like, Little Raven ink, very Courtney Diaz influence coming out here. Now, I don't know if it's because literally the prompt itself uh, lends itself to the subject matter that Courtney likes to do. I've, uh, I've seen more recently these, um, um, ghosts coming out of teacups and since this is literally a ghost coming out of a teapot I just I mean I, I guess I went straight with that influence <laughs> um, so I'm gonna straight up say that this was unintentionally completely inspired by uh, Courtney Diaz and let's just run with it I'm also gonna do a bit of a play-by-play -play today and kind of explain you through what I'm doing as I'm doing it maybe some of the reasons why I don't typically do any play-by-plays on my channel mostly because on the off chance you go and binge watch something I don't want it to become very repetitive and I feel like a lot of this stuff, like once you've heard it two or three times, it could just become really competitive. You know what I mean? If I use the same pen, I'm always saying I'm going in with this pen. Like, sometimes I feel like if you really cared to see the pen, you would just uh, pause the video and look at the pen. <laughs> or if it's um, linked down below in the description box, it's usually there too. So I don't like to bore people with um, details that, you know, seem boring to me. I don't know if it is boring to people. I know I've done a few play-by-plays and some whimsy ween videos, but it is just something that feels a little foreign to me to do very often. But I'm going to try and do it today, and look at me, I'm over two minutes in, haven't talked, I haven't done it all. I've, done, I've literally talked about what I'm going to do, but I haven't done it. Hopefully I, I stay on track, and if I don't, hopefully the tangent is entertaining and interesting. <laughs> so let's just see how we go. I'm uh, going in with the Unipin Fine Line uh, Black Pen in 005. It's a really fine pen. This one's almost dead as well, so it's been great to sketch out what I want to go for because I've not allowed myself to use a pencil through Inktober. So because this line, you know, the ink is kind of running out in this, the, uh, the nib itself is kind of worn down to a scratchy fine point, I do get to really lightly go in and map out what I want to do before I have to add any ink or uh, really commit to any lines. Uh, I, sometimes I would just paint it straight in, but I, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm just not good enough to go in and do the whole idea straight up with ink. And uh, because everything I kind of use is not water reactive, I feel a bit nervous committing to things straight away. Um, so what I'm doing now is I've actually watered down the ink to a very, very light gray wash. Sometimes I won't even water it down. I'll just have some of that dirty ink water and I'll just go straight in with the water because this ink kind of dries a little darker when you put it down light and when you put it down dark, it dries a little lighter. I've mentioned before, it's kind of like gouache like that. You never really know what tonal value you're going to get until it's dry. <laughs> but I am just putting it in the background so that I can kind of block out the background. I don't want to have to worry about any of the background details, but I do want something there. So also going in with the scrumpled, scrumpled? Scrunched up piece of paper towel. <laughs> Why does that sound like a riddle? Going in with that little paper towel and just blotting up some of that as I go. Whilst it's still wet, you can lift some of it. And the ink itself is a little staining, so when it hits the paper, it's going to feather out a little bit, especially if you're doing wet on wet techniques like I'm doing now with the teapot. Uh, but if the paper is dry, it'll kind of stain where it hits, and uh, and you can blot some of that out to give just a really subtle texture. Obviously, if you're going in with darker ink and blotting it out, you would be able to see that texture a lot better. But for the background, I didn't want anything too distracting. I wanted all of this detail and focus to be in the foreground for this piece. So uh, that's what I'm doing, and I'm just lightly layering up, lightly building up, there's a mistake, <laughs> um, lightly building up the tones on this teapot as I go. The, uh, the mistake I just mentioned, I do let the ink dry. This is a Japanese calligraphy ink, a sumi ink. It's liquid, but when it dries up, it, it kind of dries, you know, like a little, like a, almost like a little bit of coal. Uh, it's um, vegetable soot essentially. So when I when it does dry up, it kind of chips away and flakes away. And, and if you 
do reactivate that with water in that little dish or if you accidentally put it onto your page and move it around it will kind of scratch off like a, a piece of coal would uh, you know, if you dragged it across the page. So sometimes unintentionally in a few of these pieces I have done that and or some of it's the really fine particles have been caught in the bristles of the brush and they do scratch along the surface of my page and it's it's a real annoying uh, kind of a mark to get rid of. I Sometimes if it's, if it's really dark and really bold, I can't get rid of it. Uh, so that's something that I wouldn't recommend letting your ink dry in those little uh, palettes for. This is a cheap uh, $1.50 ceramic porcelain. I'm not quite sure what it really is. I think it's a little ceramic dish that I got from Daiso. I'm pretty sure it's for uh, soy sauce, but uh, you know, I just needed something for Inktober and this just screamed at me while I was walking through the Daiso. <laughs> Literally screamed at me. No, so I just picked that up and I thought that'd be good, especially since it's got three wells. What I tried to do and really failed at doing was keeping the really darkest black ink in the top well. The middle one I wanted to have like a, a mid-tone grey and the one at the bottom I wanted to have the lightest wash of grey that I was going to use in the piece. So essentially just keeping those separated so I knew where to pull from but for the most part, you know, every time I started a new piece it was just whatever I felt like putting in whatever well. <laughs> I didn't stick to any of my own rules. Um, here's one of the fun techniques that I do like to do when I want to add in a shadow and uh, or, or add an interesting effect. I like to wet the paper first. And then, uh, so you can see I'm just cleaning off my brush in between each uh, application. I'm wetting where I want that ink to feather out and bleed into, and then applying it um, you know, on the perimeter of that ghost. And so because the, it is wet around the surface area of the, um, well, around the boundary of that ghost, when I put the ink in there, it is going to feather out and bleed into that wet area. And if the wet area is enough, it can be a really nice, soft, gradual kind of a fade and you can kind of manipulate that ink around whilst it's still drying. But I just wanted that really kind of feathered look for the ghost. I thought it'd be an interesting texture. You'll see what I mean here as I'm kind of wetting that surface and then putting the ink in there. You can see that it kind of feathers out and it's a lot more soft of a, um, a blend than going straight in on the dry paper. You can do that as well, but I, I found that because I'm struggling so much with the tones, I like to build it up really softly and I like to try and have a lot of control over where the shadows are going. Because if the shadows get away from me, um, that's when I start to add too much ink to the other places to try and balance it all out. And then before you know it, it's just a gray mess everywhere. So really going in lightly with that. You can see I did the same technique down below on the ground and uh, and blotted up that ink as it was still wet just to give it a bit of texture. I think um, you kind of get a lot of credit for not doing very much when you're using this ink like that because you know how would you go about creating those textures with any other medium? You can do it with uh, watercolor definitely but watercolor will react again when you put another layer on top. If you get that area wet again all the watercolor that's down there bar the, the pigment that's already stained the page, <clears throat> pardon me, will actually lift back up and kind of uh, mess with whatever you're putting on top. The only other way you could do it uh, is with gouache, I would think, the acrylic gouache, because it would dry down flat and it's very layerable like that. And if you really watered it down, you could get some of these um, techniques, but it doesn't kind of um, pool and blend and bleed out like the ink does. The ink has its own unique properties that I just think lend itself really well to building a lot of interesting texture for not doing a lot. I feel like you just, you can do so much by doing nothing with the ink. <laughs> On the same, uh, in the same vein, you can uh, accidentally do way too much with it way too quickly. And that's another issue that I have. So it's pretty temperamental. And I'm going to say that a lot of the time, if I've ever felt like I had success with it, most of it was a bit of just potluck. I don't think I ever really could take any credit for getting the skill level better as far as planning out what I wanted to go where. I mean, sometimes I knew how to do a couple of things, but most of the time it was just very intuitive, very kind of, you know, crossing my fingers, hoping it would work as far as the ink goes. I would be interested to try a, an ink that dries waterproof in color. Um, so not any of your dye based inks, not any uh, mermaid marker or dilutions ink or anything in a little water brush. I want to know, it's, it's probably more of those acrylic inks, right? I would like to probably try some of those in color just to see if I work with that any differently than I do with watercolor. For me, I don't layer a lot of watercolor like I layer ink. I use it in the same way. I try to do the same techniques and try to uh, go about 
you know, the same idea that I would use watercolor, I try to apply to the ink, but I do notice that as far as this ink goes, because it's waterproof once it dries, I can layer a lot over and over and over and over and over again. So I, uh, I tend to, I run into that problem where I probably overwork it a little bit, a little bit too much, more than I would do with a watercolor. So um, I find that once you overwork things, that's, there's like a weird gray area right in the middle, pardon the pun since I'm working in grayscale, but there, as far as um, overworking things, if, if there's that weird gray area where, you know, it looks very loose and intuitive and kind of carefree until you've overworked it just that little bit too much. And it's such a fine line between where that is. Uh, but for me, it's, it's the layering. It's if I can see in a watercolor piece that there's like, you know, four or five distinct layers and then another layer on top. If I can see all those layers separated and it doesn't look quite uh, cohesive and kind of all melted together in the right way, that's when I start to see something that's been poured over and like labored over a lot, uh, especially if the colors start to get muddy, which in essence a watercolor, once you're adding, you know, three colors, four colors to the same mix, it does start to uh, muddy down a little bit. So. Shouldn't be talking about watercolor, not doing that, we're doing ink. I'm uh, going back in with my, um, oh, I went in with a brush pen, a zebra brush pen. You guys know those are my fave, can't rave enough about those. Um, and the uh, little fine liner there as well, and my favorite, the Uniball white gel pen, just to bring out some of those interesting like little magical confetti just around the ghost. I, I Since I had that dark gray area there and I wanted him to pop a little bit more, uh, him or her, it could be anything, um, I just wanted to kind of highlight that with something. So I did put those little magical confettis around there. But uh, going in and putting vines all over the teapot, I thought it was a nice addition because it did, it was quite a big surface area with nothing going on. At the end, I did even go over the top of that with a, um, with a light, a lighter gray wash of stripes, just because, I mean, it's, it's great once this dries because it's waterproof, so I'm not going to ruin anything. You can just build on top of stuff. So I, I do like it once the stripes come on. At this point, it still looked very much like that whole area of the page had nothing on it. And then the perimeter had a lot going on. <laughs> um, I do think at the end, I probably could have added a few more of the hanging planters. I do really like the planters and uh, possibly could have put some extra detail in the leaves of the planters, but I think I was so distracted by the fact that the teapot was such a massive teapot, um, but a very simple style teapot. I could have, um, I didn't pull a reference for the teapot, and I think I should have probably tried to draw an actual teapot so it didn't look so simple. Um, you know, even I say that, the teapot's got legs, it's definitely not like a simple just teapot, but you know what I mean, like it's a very basic shape, it's got one spout, it's just got the little topper on it, and, uh, and I think there could have been a lot more going on there. And because I did want to add extra detail and dimension, but couldn't figure out a way to do it to the teapot without destroying it, you know, once the stripes were on, I thought if I do anything else, it's going to start becoming a lot. Uh, I just decided to add stuff to the outside. So putting lots of little water droplets that, you know, don't have to mean anything. They could be rain or they could just be more texture for the background. I, um, I think, you know, over time, I never used to be like this, but over time I've allowed myself just to do things even if there's no reason to do them. Like, things on the page don't actually have to mean anything. If if people want to think that there's something, then that's great too, and everyone will have their own interpretation of what things are, but, you know, I used to... I, in the past, I would have looked at that and thought, well, this has to be rain then. So it's raining, so, you know, she's got to have wet hair or something, or her dress has got to be like a little damp, or, you know what I mean? There'd have to be a reason for it. But nowadays, I just think, well, the reason is I wanted some more texture, and that's enough for me. It might not be enough for some people, but, I mean, honestly, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm still uh, I'm still into that thought process that as you look at something, you would take the whole thing in as a whole before you start to dissect little bits and pieces. Like, um, I don't know if you'd notice to look at it straight away, but Daisy almost looks like she's floating off into nowhere because she's not necessarily standing on that ground or, you know, a ground in air quotes, it doesn't even look like ground, it's just like this little mountain of nothing. <laughs> so um, I tend to let go of all that stuff and there's doesn't have to be a great reason for anything these days, which is uh, a little bit more freeing. Sometimes it can be a little, it can result in a little unusual kind of a piece, but for this one, I think it, it came out pretty well and I'm, I'm really happy with it. I'm excited to show you tomorrow's. That was a really simple one. <laughs> Um, but for now, I hope you enjoyed day 25 and uh, I'll be back again, yeah, like I said, tomorrow for the King Kitty Kite. 
in the Midnight Sprite. I cannot believe I had a typo on that list. I'm so upset. 